Hello, dear friends and colleagues. Uh, welcome, and thank you so much for tuning in and attending my session. My name is Larissa Elisha. I am violin, viola, chamber music, and string pedagogy professor at Fred and Dinah Grech School of Music at Georgia Southern University. I am so happy to have you all here and discuss topic that probably is crucial for everybody, how to practice and practice successfully. We all want to be successful, efficient, develop quickly, but everyone is unique and every age group is unique and requires different approaches. But there are also some similar rules that we can apply for maximum efficiency. And it's clear that every stage of development, musical and technical development, will require slightly different approaches and practicing techniques. But first, I wanted to establish certain condition that, conditions that we have to consider. Uh, first of all, it's really important to set expectations. That would be expectations for us as teachers and expectations for our students. And make sure that uh, every lesson is clear uh, and covers with exactly type of preparation we're expecting and how to achieve the best possible results. Sometimes I'm spending, spending time during the lesson just to teach how this practicing process will go and what exactly has to be done and what we want to expect. So in our own practicing sessions as uh, formed professional musicians, we also set our self expectations and also marking results at the end of every session. So that's great to use the same for our students. Another po point of conditions, I consider retaining the information because how often we have students doing uh, wonderful progress during the lesson and later on the information is getting just uh, gone, this disappears. So in order to retain information and uh, be successful with that process, I recommend my students to take notes. And a notebook is really used as a resource of knowledge of what and how to practice as well what should be prepared for the next lesson. And of course, some students are taking fantastic notes and that doesn't have to be necessarily put in my words during the lesson or teacher's word, but that can be just their impression of certain things, their feelings of certain things. But for younger kids, probably uh, assistance of professor would be really helpful to make sure that they are doing right thing. Uh, very often, um, some note collections could become a very helpful method book slash reference for future teaching experiences. It's also very helpful to use audio and video recordings. I had students who really benefited from that unbelievably just having that recorded for them they felt like they had me during their practicing sessions at home all the time some students more advanced students would prefer to record maybe just only part of the lesson uh, to capture maybe some information or demonstration or quality of sound and that helps them as well uh, sometimes when i am working on transitional changes of certain um mm, basic problems uh, referring to our instrument adjustment, the way we hold it, the way we hold our bow, the way we apply certain techniques on the left hand. I like to even take photos of a uh, position that is not the most efficient and maybe not most fortunate and later on to present to students just immediately after I adjust that different positioning of their hands. So there's a um, uh, basic foundational issues are very often connected to visual plus uh, uh, touch and feeling of things so having that recorded or captured uh, that is really helpful as well as using mirror that is also excellent tool to control things uh, another condition that I find very important that is communication, because it's very important to communicate to our students and important for students to communicate to their teachers, ask questions to make sure that everything that was said is actually uh, kind of synced in and we understand what we're talking about. Make sure that there are a complete understanding of expectations and a complete understanding of types of practicing uh, tools we are about to use. Uh, communication uh, with student in general, that is very important because that will also uh, be our individual approach to each uh, uh, in 
each personalities and each level of understanding and different backgrounds, which would require different uh, access to practicing tools. So now going uh, directly to what we want to achieve and how we want to practice to be successful, I think it's very important to establish purpose. It's not just opening our uh, cases and start practicing. It's good to establish what is the purpose. I am asking my students to ask themselves uh, these questions. Why I'm learning it and what I'm trying to achieve, not just to try to play through things mechanically. What techniques I'm trying to develop and what exact tools I have to use in order to achieve it. In terms of preparation, let's say that is new piece or that is lesson preparation, maybe that is preparation for performances when we have large recital program or audition competitions uh, that will be different preparation as well in different practicing. Uh, certain things in our practicing routine we are just reviewing because we already worked on it maybe yesterday other things require to be secured and other things require to be learned and some things will need additional applications in order to be accomplished um, and of course when we are uh, suggesting to our students uh, how to practice being at school under a uh, teacher's assignment under teacher supervision is a little bit different, but I feel that my goal is always to teach students how to practice when they are on their own. So they really know how to continue developing, how to continue enriching their uh, experiences while they're practicing. So this independent practice of professional musician is us kind of our a goal for future to make sure that our students, when they leave our studios, they are really efficient and successful. Plus, they can share this knowledge to the new generations of young musicians. Uh, part of the practicing routine, I think, uh, is really important part to learn to analyze and no really uh, approach that would cover many, many, many things at the same time, analysis of details and later on synthesis, of course. So when we're learning about the piece, we're learning about composer, particular period of history, connections to other forms of art, like for example, playing impressionistic uh, uh, musical piece, we learn where that started and how poetry and visual arts are related to the impressionism and music. So by having kind of broad approach and interest to many things, helps to uh, see this piece that we're working on as something very, very complex and develops uh, not only in terms of learning notes and phrasing, but develops kind of cultural uh, approach to the things. Um, knowing score in every detail is very important, regardless if that is solo work, or if we're looking into harmony and we're trying to understand polyphonic writing or uh, just uh, marking tonal plan, understanding the relationships between solo, let's say, and accompanying parts to understand in concertos how the score work and where are solo instruments and how maybe we are communicating with some of them and how we may want to imitate or match the uh, timbre. Uh, don't know about tempo relations, uh, imitating and collaborating with other orchestra instruments. That is kind of like really, really interesting part of the work. And uh, after we know all the details, it's important to know how we want to put it back together. Uh, ensemble work, uh, that gives us a great opportunity to learn about other parts and uh, practice and listen with the score so we know what exactly is happening uh, in other parts. Um, interpretation of the part and interpretation of even simple piece that we're learning that is a very unique process and even with the younger students it's good to present to them how that could be played in a different way and why we would choose this particular moment and maybe this particular dynamic or even fingering to create so certain uh, musical and artistic idea 
And by learning to separate every motive uh, and to know the structure of motives, like for example, we do very often when we are analyzing um, Bach solo pieces and uh, to know how to phrase it and to know about passages and all little details, uh, understanding all the ar architecture of the piece, then that makes it easy for us to put it together. Um, so I would, uh, suggest that by expanding the scope of our goals during practicing that uh, enriches us incredibly that when we think not about just notes but we think about sounds articulations and combining so many different tools that we need to achieve artistic and interpretational goals I use the term of toolbox for all the techniques that we have to develop in order to achieve artistic results. And we don't need to wait until application of our interpretational goals will appear. We don't want to just start learning notes, even though when we are just first time we see the piece and depending on the level of the student, of course, uh, that will be different process and we have to learn notes, but how often uh, students are trying to learn notes in some solid and mechanical detached way and they don't want to connect it with music. And when we can envision the final result, artistic result, we know what tools to use in order to achieve it. And I mean, like knowing the articulations and final tempo, we will know which part of the bow to use. We will know what kind of color we want to use, knowing the style and uh, genre of the music we're performing. We would use different type of vibrato and we will use even different way of we're producing certain uh, uh, sounds and colors, and I think that is really, really important. Uh, we are sometimes uh, facing some mistakes because it's, sometimes it's unavoidable because that may be kind of like a habit and that happens a lot. So I would kind of uh, share with you what I think belongs to this group of unwanted uh, habits and mistakes. I would say that we shouldn't use mindless repetition because that creates unwanted habits and that will require extra time to undo. I call it negative practicing when there's by repeating wrong things that really later on takes time to uh, work to undo them. Mechanical approach in general without constant feedback in observation and analysis may make the entire process actually fruitless and boring. Uh, feedback is really important. And uh, by recording even little fragments of some part of the work that we are working on, uh, that helps us to develop, so I call it third ear, because we're so close to our instrument. And sometimes there is kind of like, uh, misunderstanding of our efforts and we think we achieved something but in reality that didn't happen or we want to see how much bow we're using because we imagine that we used a lot of bow and in reality that didn't happen plus by developing third ear having this recording device maybe uh, away from us in learning how that sounds actually not right after under our chin but how that sounds in the concert hall that is very helpful. Uh, another mistake that happens very often, we do stop when we have to work on little details, sometimes working by bar or by, by phrase, and we piece things together and organizing things. That's very important type of practice. But sometimes when we decide to play through, we are also stop and correct things. I found that that can be really damaging when somebody has, tries to perform and play through the piece and they kind of incorporate it in their practice, continuous loops and stops, that doesn't help. So it's very important to differentiate. Am I working on details right now or I want to play through and kind of follow this routine without stopping, maybe just uh, remembering what didn't go the way we wanted and then go back and fix it, but during play through a uh, goal not to stop. Um, also is uh, very often we are lacking a kind of application of already learned materials. 
I call it associative thinking. If we covered particular articulation in exposition, probably we can easily apply the same things in recapitulation, in, in Sonata Allegro form, of course. But uh, very often, just by turning next page, suddenly that appears like a new material that we don't know how to approach. So this kind of like uh, looking through entire work and trying to combine different techniques that are actually have the same application and maybe practicing them next to each other that really helps our brain also to accomplish this understanding and associative thinking another thing that happens unfortunately that we are learning wrong notes so pay attention to the tempo style genre of your music and pay attention to your notes because learning wrong notes sometimes becomes a real problem because by repeating it a few times somehow brain is trying to hold on to it and correct notes suddenly don't feel right um, anticipation that is really important technique and we will be talking about that uh, also later for another uh, goals but in general, when we are trying to play through the piece that we are learning, it's important to look ahead because at the moment when we saw something, we don't need to continue looking at it. It's like driving our car, we don't look in front of it, we look ahead. This way of looking ahead helps our brain to kind of prepare for the next uh, technique or next even note, or in our case, and for shifting, for application of uh, preparation. So that's really important moment. Um, also, I noticed that some uh, students like to uh, put certain pieces on back burner just because they play, played it last week and they will work on another piece. But by the time they come back to that piece that was covered really wonderfully, they are losing a kind of touch with this work. So uh, ongoing working process is very important in planning is very important, which we will be talking about in a moment. Um, and it's really important to be able to manage work on a larger repertoire. So those are kind of conditions that I wanted to outline. Now, we're going directly to effectiveness of practice. Uh, like a very wonderful and great Russian pedagogue, Yuri Yankelevich was stating in his work playing the instrument that is psychophysiological process so our brain that is amazing tool and we really have to connect that with all the uh, techniques that we're trying to achieve and understand how our brain works first of all uh, he was very interested in the perception and development of the psychophysiological components of violin playing this approach is based on development of musical ideas and the motor skills that are required to accomplish the artistic and interpretational goals like quality of sound, tone, vibrato, articulations, etc. Based on psychophysiological approach, the practicing must be in connection between conscious soul, thought and technical mastery. And I have to tell that all those ideas didn't just happen and came only from Yankelevich. He was containing traditions of Mostras, Saitlin and Yampolsky. And already in their works, we see this dedication to neurological process and work of the brain and how that is connected to our motor skills. Um, we need to really learn how to effectively apply information. Uh, and uh, as we talked before, just to learn from ourselves, because what we already learned in pieces that we maybe played a year ago, or maybe months ago, or maybe that was just in the first moment, we can apply those techniques and uh, analyze and notice similarities. So another thing that is really important for us and not to go on automatic, it means to keep under control every single function is again uh, our brain uh, work and brain control. Uh, since we're talking about brain work, it's really important not to just force ourselves to work just because we decided I am doing another hour, but to make sure that we are actually in connection with our instrument and our goals. So sometimes we may be very tired and really uh, our mind is drifting away. So take breaks, take as many breaks as you need. 
um, hydrate yourself. Make sure that you are in good condition, mental condition, in order to continue working. Yuri Yankelevich was mentioning that not muscles should get tired, our brain should get tired. So Yankelevich was talking about different ways of practice, and that is very interesting uh, moment here. So one of those was with instrument and music. That is basically what we are doing in our practicing all the time. Another will be with instrument and without music when we're memorizing pieces and working with the instrument, but we don't have music in front of us. With music and without the instrument, um, that would be something that really involves our artistic imagination when we are planning things, analyzing the score, and we can actually, by having music in our hands, without instrument, we can plan and phrase and analyze and prepare things. Um, that kind of practice I was using when I was a very young student and I had to take trolley to get me to uh, all my school and that was kind of like long, right? 35 minute ride. Right? So I was practicing with my music without instrument in my hands. Another is imagining playing without the music and instrument. That is incredible in internalized process that can happen only on very high level of development when we know every single way, every single note and shape in our piece, or if we're working on particular phrasing or passage, or if that is ensemble piece, or if that is something that takes our mind that we can imagine actually working ourselves through that and be in the process without having music and instrument. I think that is really high level of practicing when we are kind of um, available for in, internalizing things on a very high level and we can play internally, not only through our hands and through our imagination, but through our kind of being present in that process. I personally also include form of practicing that as practice with music and recording that involves involves actual studying the score, not just to listen to the recording as background or when we are driving our car, which is okay fine, but it's not the starting of the score and we can say that we actually prepared by learning the music of that piece that we're working on. So that is really helpful to practice with music and recording. And of course, I recommend to listen to different recordings, not because we are so afraid to imitate some particular artist. It would be bad if we could do that, right? But we really have to activate our imagination and our abilities to create and uh, interpret music. And when we hear different players and how they do that in very really different ways, that also is activating our own interests for developing some of our own ideas. And when we are offering students different recordings and opportunities to listen how different people approach similar works, that also enriches their kind of uh, horizon and they want to try to develop their own sense of interpretation. Um, I wanted to also to speak about specific points and practicing techniques for us as string players, uh, which can be easily applied to other instruments as well, is visual anticipation that I mentioned before uh, in reading the music. Uh, really, in string playing, when both hands playing together actually require anticipated left hand and then right hand. It's not like in piano playing, two hands together means absolutely at the same time. In a way, in string playing, left hand anticipates slightly. And uh, visual anticipation helps our brain to get prepared for this type of technique. Auditory anticipation. Here we come to, again, a really interesting term that Yuri Yankilevich was using pre-hearing and pre-feeling. That is perfect example of psychophysiological approach in work on intonation and shifting. Because how often if we cannot sing certain interval, we cannot shift there. And if we don't understand certain um, uh, 
connections and certain nodes and we cannot sing them and we can hear them internally we cannot produce them on instrument so it's really just pre-hearing and pre-feeling uh, that is form of anticipation and that is really important to develop and uh, use uh, form analysis is very helpful because that includes tonal plan which uh, helps us a lot uh, like, for example, in music of different genres and different time periods, sometimes by knowing tonal plan and marking it even, that may be very helpful in Baroque music, but that can be helpful also in 20th century and modern music, when we have to use enharmonic exchange in order to apply different fingerings for us to achieve and understand certain, or maybe clusters and chords and preparation of certain things. Um, another thing that I think is really crucial is correct first time reading that not only includes correct notes, which is obvious, that includes just in style scope of things, understanding tempo, understanding uh, key signature, understanding uh, genre, understanding time period. So correct first time reading actually um, makes a strong imprint on us when we start learning the piece. Uh, very often uh, in string playing, I notice that students will have problems how to approach the trills and grace notes, and of course, uh, interpretation of ornaments is that is all separate story, different presentation depending on uh, genre and time period. But in general, I would recommend to practice without ornaments first to establish correct rhythmic structure and then, then to know where to place ornaments and trills. Also, it's important to understand what notes are involved in trills. Sometimes that is a problem as well. And to know about uh, referencing key signature or all markings in music, that is very important. Uh, some students, I notice that they have issues in very high positions, uh, high registers, sometimes intonation issues, because some, for some people, if they didn't play uh, enough, and, upper registers yet their ear and sense of pitch is not sensitive enough to notice what is wrong so I recommend to practice it in lower octave or maybe even in first position to establish the knowledge what notes are there and then to transfer where that needs to be done. Another thing is efficiency and confidence of course that doesn't happen on its own efficiency and confidence comes from good practice in understanding of things and that is very very helpful because we can continue questioning ourselves about everything we have to be confident about what we do uh, sometimes between our efforts and the results there is a huge gap and some students may practice a lot and worked a lot and suddenly they don't see results Usually, if there are no results, probably wrong practicing techniques were used. Sometimes if something was learned just now, right before the lesson, maybe brain needs a little bit of processing time in order for that to be produced really well, depending on the person, of course. But sometimes we need a few days and some time in our practicing organization for things to be efficient. Um, so we have to understand results of our efforts and analyze what did we do incorrectly and maybe use by using correct tools that would be really more effective and working on effective application of every particular technique that will be our goal so we want to make sure that every practicing session is effective and we focus on implementation of musical ideas to know exactly what we want to do. Analyzing results of our practice, fo focusing on positive things in our practice, uh, not dwell on negative. I often tell my students to select this part of their piece that they play, or maybe even one note that sounds beautiful, and focus on that and distribute that and develop that and kind of like try to copy yourself try to kind of develop what you already achieved, that is better than focusing on one incorrect passage, because that is kind of not very really helpful. Uh, sometimes we can try to play with along with recordings. That shouldn't be long-term practicing uh, a tool, but that sometimes helps to understand the final tempo of the piece, 
that helps with orchestral parts learning, that helps sometimes with chamber music, just to understand where we are and how we can keep up with other players being on the roll and moving through. Um, uh, we really want to make sure that we are not using, I call it autopilot, when we need to do selective control over details, or we don't try to go a manual when piece is already prepared and is played in very fast tempo. So uh, how to manage those things when we are allowing ourselves to go and we trust our preparation or when we have to put uh, uh, our manual control in work and check everything. I think it's when we practice in slow tempo, sometimes there is a very common mistake of practicing something very slowly and then jump into very fast tempo. And we would hear that, oh, I practice it in slow tempo for so long and I still can play in fast tempo. So I think there are specific ways of preparing for fast tempo and there are specific exercises and for specific things. And I will not get into that uh, much right now, but uh, when we are trying to transition from one tempo to another, there should be gradual transition from slow tempo to fast tempo in order to transfer the information and experience that we learn. And also when we practice in slow tempo, I always suggest my students to know where we will be playing that in fast tempo. Because we are, if we are to, uh, using entire whole bow when we are preparing some uh, fast piccato, sorti, uh, articulation, it, that will not be helpful. We have to coordinate uh, impulses between the right and left hand in order to prepare for faster tempo. And when this process is uh, carried in graduate uh, transition kind of way, that makes sense. Otherwise, we have two different ways of practicing. Very slow tempo, wrong parts of the bow, no coordination between hands. And later on, we're trying to do it in fast tempo. So basically, we spend time, we're practicing, but that is not very effective. Uh, also, I uh, recommend to use and develop uh, a memory of the movement because there is a memory of something what we do and coordinate, like ball placement and coordination. And if we don't think about it, it's kind of sometimes for some people, it's not registered at all. So we want to refer to something that was already done, but there is no memory of that uh, successful result. So that cannot be transferred to other experiences. So our goal is to accomplish artistic and technical results at the same time and know what we want to uh, achieve in our interpretational uh, world and then to use necessary tools for that. Time management, that is an important pro problem for um, many of us because uh, our students being so busy and not knowing how to manage their time, sometimes uh, planning, scheduling, organizing and following assignments, that requires very special discipline and training. So I provide my students with special practicing charts and I have different types of charts, so rubrics, but I also encourage students to create their own if they would prefer that. Uh, that is not for very advanced players who already had experience of preparing for competitions, uh, performing their recitals on many occasions. They already know how to do that. But in order to get there, we really have to learn how to manage a large program and how to know which work was getting more attention during the week and which work maybe wasn't and how to manage and accumulate uh, equal amount of attention throughout the week and month. So I found that this control helps students and helps me very often to see how they're developing and how they're progressing. Motivation and inspiration is an important moment. Of course, uh, sometimes students may not feel motivated even to open their case, right? And start practicing. So we have to get started because when we are getting into process, it's really hard to stop because we're ex excited about this process if we're doing it correctly. So uh, I would use for inspiration that could be uh, 
lots of demonstration during our lessons, playing together, analyzing things, uh, using individual individual approach for uh, every learning experiences and focus on also um, interests of every particular student. Using performances like we have a studio recitals or any recitals that we can create playing for friends, for family, uh, in on the uh, studio class that we have uh, in our uh, universities, uh, when students can perform in front of each other, that is really excellent motivation. And that is inspirational as well, because by listening to each other, students really want to develop and sometimes they will even spot certain piece and they will ask, oh, I would like to play that piece. That is definitely an inspiration that we want to uh, kind of develop. Also listening to great performers and analyzing their uh, playing, that would be very helpful. Our selection of the repertoire is an essential component of psychophysiological approach. That includes the repertoire choices that will highlight emotional responses and on another hand will help develop students weaknesses because we want to target things that will develop every everybody uh, and that will be very individual approach but at the same time we don't want to make somebody play something that they really feel uh, disconnected from that piece uh, but also we may try to uh, change uh, students opinion about certain piece by demonstrating that playing with them and trying to find some positive uh, sides of this work in general, a choice of repertoire can make huge difference in effectiveness of practice and results because it brings in excitement and directly motivates to practice. Uh, practicing memorization and learning how to memorize. Uh, you know, the different times right now when uh, students use music a lot, but I remember when I was a student and I was a developing even as a little a uh, child, I just didn't know that we may not memorize. That wasn't a question. We memorized everything. And later on, we memorized it in sonatas. So I think that is the way we think about that. If that is becoming point of stress, uh, that definitely is unnecessary. And stress is usually related to fear of having memory slip. And uh, I believe if we allow our students to perform from memory enough, they feel more secure. If somebody just learned something and memorized something, and that is such fresh experience, and they have to go on the stage and perform, the only thing they will be thinking about not to have memory sleep, and they will not think about musicality, phrasing, and they will not be part of the process of performing process. And that can be very stressful as well. So in, in, in order to avoid that, I never assign students to memorize something like that is the goal. I am uh, talking always about natural ways of uh, uh, applying this technique. So usually, as long as we keep our visual attachment to the music, memorization will not kick in. Like, for example, orchestra musicians who play the same works for years, they will not have entire work memorized, but they will have all the passages that they practice uh, backstage with that music, they will have all those passages memorized because we worked on them. So I recommend to allow our brain to start memorization practice, uh, process by practicing parts of the piece without looking into music. It doesn't mean that we have to hide music, but we can turn away from the stand. And little by little, one phrase after another, uh, one page after another, we will realize actually we do have it memorized because we practice that without looking all the time. So our visual and our sense of memorization, uh, we have to allow our brain to start memorizing and not to stare into music all the time. That would really, really help. And that also we want to compare experiences. There is some security maybe on one side when we have music, but the freedom and musicality that we achieve when we play without music, that's absolutely different. Also, um, I wouldn't recommend to try to uh, use forceful and immediate attempts to memorize peace in a short amount of time. 
or that sometimes turns into mechanical repetition and creates a very stressful environment. I think in memorization process, what we are afraid of sometimes, or our students are afraid of, that uh, they will miss their place and they will have to start all the way from certain place where they were practicing that from the beginning or certain section. So I always recommend to practice digital memory. It's kind of ability to be able to start from any point in the piece. So not to practice only from particular comfortable point of the piece, but to practice maybe without looking into music from any part of it. That kind of gives, gives us psychological comfort because we know that we can begin at any point and therefore our brain knows every digital point of the piece and we don't have to be afraid of losing it. Uh, how we learn to sight read? Also, that can be a problem for somebody who takes it as a stressful process. In reality, if we never do it and we don't practice it enough, that is something very foreign. So anticipation that will be key word in this process. Um, we need to practice sight reading as often as possible. If we can do it in an orchestra and we can do it in chamber groups, which is really, really fun, just put it on stage, uh, understand your book of etudes, any piece that you never played before, chamber music part, and just try to read through. Uh, anticipation, this visual anticipation that we kind of covered before is really important because by kind of looking ahead, sometimes more than one bar ahead, that helps. I call it advanced scanning because our brain and our eyes are able to scan in advance and we can very successfully see what is coming. But before we even attempt to start sight reading, I think this quick glancing on a page and trying to establish all the information we can get, with the informa all the information that is available on the page uh, like composer's name, is if available. Key signature, meter, tempo, markings, to read all, all things that we have there. In general, markings are so important because if we treat them as a message, direct message from composer, that makes it really very important in our preparation of the pieces. So in this case, we want to be incredibly quick and learning this quick assessment application of quick assessment that requires a little bit of practice and technique that will be really kind of quick scanning, uh, advanced scanning, and that can be done, definitely. Also, when we play some pieces, we have to imagine that we're actually playing with conductor, if that is orchestral piece, or even if that is uh, just etude, it's really important to feel that we don't want to go back and fix it. We can practice it, yes, but in sight reading, if like if we would play with conductor and the time is going on and we cannot just get off this train and fix something and go back, we just have to continue. So sense of uh, um, bar lines, sense of meter, sense of rhythmic control has to be incorporated in that practice and that really helps. It doesn't mean that we're uh, coming to rehearsals unprepared and we will be reading, material, of course not, but abilities to sight read really quick and really wonderfully that really opens up uh, taking under consideration that the psychophysiological process, our brain abilities, brain's abilities to cover things in advance and get familiar with material that we didn't see before in very short amount of time, that is a really wonderful possibility for us, a really wonderful gift. Uh, and I would like to end really quick for this preparation for performances, competitions, and auditions. This topic in itself could be topic for an entire different se uh, session, but I just wanted to talk about uh, that insecurities that accompany our preparations for that such uh, events are linked to a lack of performing experiences and training to perform. So we want to use all the opportunities possible. We need to use the recording opportunities as well and record, uh, uh, performing opportunities in development, developing the third era that we were talking about in order to be prepared to play a larger repertoire to play in front of people. Because when we play more often, actually, that is absolutely different sense of things. There is more of excitement than fear or stress. 
and uh, developing physical and mental endurance. That is also a very important point because for such performances, we need really abilities to cover different pieces of different characters and genres. And sometimes it's physically uh, re requires uh, abilities for us to sustain and we need to know how to prepare for that and where we need to relax and we may relax and where we need to be very strong and move forward. Uh, without having great repertoire, we can't approach any competitions or auditions or create wonderful recital performances. So building a solid repertoire for those events, that would be really important. And as uh, Yuri Yankelevich was thinking, uh, about the little kids and their future. He was working with young kids as well. He was in charge of developing the special uh, school uh, schools for gifted. That is something that we were so lucky later on to attend. And he was working with younger kids and he said that younger kids also need master teachers. Because he said, when I'm working with a young child, I am looking into perspective development of the student and how the student will be able to perform, for example, Brahms violin concerto. So this way of looking ahead and preparing and building future experiences, I think that would be really important for our success in this process. Thank you so very much. Uh, and uh, I am looking forward to hearing from you back if you have any questions. Of course, feel free to reach out if you would like to have workshops or master classes. And you can email me directly. My full name, Larissa Elisha at georgiasouthern.edu. Thank you so much. Bye bye.